Okay, good afternoon. My name is Sean Heinbaugh. It's a pleasure to be here. I believe this is my 14th grower meeting with you guys. And it's always good to get here and see you, see you all. A lot of you, I remember your face. Some of you, I remember your name. I'm not the best at that. But uh, anyhow, again, my name's Sean. We've talked about soybeans here. We've talked about corn here. We've talked about small grains. So if there are things that you guys want to get into and gals, we can talk about whatever you want to talk about. Today I've got a presentation prepared. I've been told I've been demoted to the setup guy for Andy. I'm the eighth inning guy. Andy's now the closer. So uh, now he's got some great things to say, but I want to get you in a mindset here and take you, take you back in history and time. And we, we've all been to a lot of these places and we're gonna talk about some of the irritations that we have faced throughout history. Who's, who's been irritated before? <laughs> yeah. Right now. Of course, yeah, right now, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> remember, right? <laughs> well, let's talk about some of the irritations that we deal with in our business. And I, and I viewed this from a Growmark FS standpoint, you know, we talk about seed. We deal with seed, we deal with crop protection, we deal with fertilizer, and most recently, we deal a lot more with data, don't we? We deal a lot more with data. Who's heard of big data? Right? Everybody in here has heard of big data, unless you've been living under a rock, which I had to do that for a little while. Anyhow, we'll get into data management eventually but before we get there let's talk about some of the game changers we've had in some of these other other areas I think back to early civilization and the caveman the earliest uh, of creations here maybe one of the most significant ever the wheel and these are what I would call the innovators and I think there are a lot of innovators in this group these are the cavemen and if you can't see it in the back, it says, if this works, it'll change everything. We could open up a casino. <laughs> and I think there are a lot of people in this room that are trying to make a stone wheel into that casino. You're forward thinking. There's some others out there. And, and this, this is me sometimes. Tell me again, why is your wheel better? Right? I want to see more data. I want to know, why, why is that better than what I'm already doing? I think a lot of us are like that. And some of us, flat out, who, who's been this guy? If mindless back-breaking work was good enough for my ancestors, it's good enough for me. Who says that? Who's been that guy within the past hour? That's me, right? I'm the guy that's, uh, I've been building this house for, I don't know how many years now, but I'm trying to put, build trim, my own trim with a draw knife, you know? I'm like, what am I doing? People come in the house and, how you making out? My friend told me the other day, he said, I have to distance my trips to your house far enough apart so it looks like you've got something done. <laughs> he doesn't come around very often. But anyhow, that's me sometimes. And, and I think as we do things on our operations and in our life, some days we're this guy, we look and feel like geniuses, and some days we're, we're this guy, right? I probably settle in the air somewhere. That's just me personally. Uh, I work with people. And you all know these kind of people where it's nothing but ideas constantly. And I used to have a boss, he would come up with 10 ideas an hour, and maybe one would be okay, you know. But always thinking ahead, always thinking ahead. And I think a lot of people in this room are like that. Okay, back to seed. Talk about the good old days of seed, right? Back in, who was farming in 1930? Anybody in here? No, me neither. You talk about pre-1930, what was corn production like in those days? Before then, yields were flat. We were flatlining as a nation, as a, the United States, we were not gaining much yield in those days. What else was going on? The corn was also flat. Very little agronomic characteristics that were desirable. Also, no stress tolerance. Talk about the 30s. Uh, the late 30s there we had, if you, if you are into history, what happened in that time period? Uh, the Dust Bowl, right? Some of the worst droughts the United States has ever faced. And global warming. Global warming. <laughs> global warming. 
average back in there, and you probably can't see it, incidentally, pre-1930, about 30 bushel per acre average on corn. Wow, that, that's just hard, hard to swallow. Most people in those days were farmers. What percent nowadays are farmers? Two, three percent. It's, it's crazy to think that most people were farmers back then. We had wall-to-wall -wall farmland because we had to. <laughs> From about 1918, there was a, a guy who, or was a, actually a team of scientists that figured out, hey, if we make these crosses and develop a single cross and a double cross, we can develop hybrids. And that was a game changer. That was a big time game changer back in those days. And about that time, guess what? Population started to do what? It's starting to go up in our country. We needed, we needed some relief from that 30 bushel per acre average. Uncle Sam started investing in the land grant universities, institutions. <clears throat> they figured out that if we dump money into these breeding programs, we can make some real significant genetic gains. And out of that uh, came a lot of money. And eventually, two major parents, B73 and Missouri 17, came in, uh, out of that, those programs. And those were still used up into the 80s. So you've all grown. Anybody who's been growing corn since pre-1980 has probably had some of this parentage in their hybrids. You think about corn growing in, in the 80s, and in, in the 70s, and maybe even in the 90s, what were some of the challenges we had? What were some of the challenges? Who's growing that big, tall, those big, tall hybrids? What were the populations we were putting out? 19, 20,000, right? They yielded pretty good. I, talked to, I actually talked to my boss about this a couple of weeks ago. He said yield really wasn't the issue. It was trying to get it to stand. And then the next thing that happened was southern corn leaf blight came in in a lot of areas and, and pretty much annihilated those two products. So anyhow, back to what I was saying before. On the left, you've got yield. Down at the bottom, you've got time. This is 1850. You can see yield trends across the United States were flat, flat, flat up until about right here. That's when hybrid corn, the first single crosses and double crosses came about. So we went from not just irritations, but... On, I don't want to say on the edge of starvation, but in some places on the edge of starvation to a solution. The industry along the way has come up with solutions. What else happened right about in here? Who knows their history? A couple of wars in there, right? Had World War I and World War II. We'll talk about that in a second. So we covered a lot of this. Talk about irritations to solutions in seed. We'll stick with the seed right now. What happened in the 90s? Who's heard of Roundup Ready? Has anybody ever used Roundup Ready? <laughs> Has anybody not used Roundup Ready? There's always one or two in a crowd. This was sort of the first marriage between genetics and chemistry, right? We started to see this back in the 90s. A lot of that land grant money from Uncle Sam going to, to those land grant institutions for breeding programs was drying up. The whole intent was to get that privatized, and it kind of worked. There's a company by the name of Holden's Foundation Seed that was developed, and they were starting to hit their stride back in the 80s, and it became real apparent in the 80s that by the 90s we would have these so-called trade integrations in the corn, and that happened in a big time way. But that's about when I started in this industry. First thing that came out was Roundup Ready. That was uh, that was a big deal. Up in the uh, upper right hand corner, this is a fellow that I went to school with. We were working on his master's project with the first BT corn, splitting stalks, counting corn bore tunnels, counting corn bores. These were big time things. That was at Penn State. After that, we saw rootworm corn. Who grows silage here? Any silage growers? Who's corn on corn? This changed a lot of what we do, didn't it? This changed a lot. As a guy who plants a lot of plots, you know, we used to have to load those insecticide boxes when we're planting plots. Who likes loading insecticide in your planter? Who enjoys that? Anyone here for a hat? Bruce does. <laughs> he raised his hand. You get to give him a hat, Katie. 
it changed a lot of what we do, this trade integration. <clears throat> also, Holton's figured out that if we improve some of the agronomic traits, like standability, guess what else we can do? You know, our populations a little bit. And guess what else that did? Took yields up. So as a, an indirect result, yields went up when they improved agronomics. So a lot of different things happened along the way. We had a lot of irritations. Who's dealt with lodging corn? It's just no fun, right? Who's dealt with insect-ridden corn? Lodged corn from corn borer. Lodged corn from rootworm. Very irritating, very irritating. The industry, again, has come up with solutions. So I would challenge you in this room to think about it and, and give yourself a grade. Which end of the spectrum are you on? The stubborn caveman or are you, are you the innovator? I would suggest skeptic. the skeptic. I think a lot of us fall in there, but I would argue if you look at yield graphs over time, most of the people in this room are on that side or lean this, this side to that innovator. After what you guys do, you know, it's easy for me to stand up here and beat you down and say, you need to come on board with this technology right now, right now, right now, and we think you're moving slow. That is not the case. You guys are moving at light speed. I can make that argument very easily. Okay, so we've talked about seed, some of the irritations, and I'm just hitting some of the game changers out there. How about weed control? Are weeds irritating to anyone? <laughs> of course they are. They're ridiculous. Who's used atrazine? You're all very familiar with the label, I know that. <laughs> I'm not going to give you a quiz. <laughs> so in the 50s, I think it was actually 56, this product was invented. It was approved by 58. These pictures were given to me by my old boss, Greg Roth, Dr. Roth at, at Penn State. He said his predecessor gave, gave him these pictures, and they, they hang on his office wall. But And really... You look at the 50s versus the 90s, sort of the same thing when we're talking about plot work and experiments. Weeds were a problem then, they're a problem now, aren't they? Very irritating. Atrazine still, I think it's, I believe it's the second most used chemical out there. Who, who's still using it? It just does something to that mix, doesn't it? it? It makes a difference. How about glyphosate? We've all been there and done this. It's not working as good as it used to. And so we're, now we've got new ir irritations to address, don't we? But here we got, in 1974, glyphosate was, was uh, discovered slash invented. By 94, inserted into the seed, that first marriage of seed and chemistry. By 96, it was in soybeans. And I think by 97 or so, 98, it was in corn. So we've all, we've all been exposed to that. So there have been a lot of advancements. A lot of these things, a lot of these advancements have come out of these irritations. Here's something here that came uh, in fertilizer. We'll move on to fertilizer. Who's heard of Fritz Haber? Anyone in here? Nobody's heard of this guy yet. Anyone for a hat? <laughs> so Fritz Haber was a chemist from Germany. He was a chemist from Germany, and in 1909, what was going on in Germany? He discovered a way to make ammonia from nitrogen and hydrogen gas. And why is that important? Basically, he figured out a cheap and easy way to make ammonium nitrate. And wh why would that be important in that time? Explosives, right? Before then, they were using potassium nitrate, which is what? It's part of gunpowder, if I'm not mistaken. They mined it. It was expensive, very explosive, but expensive. Fritz Haber came up with a process to make this stuff and make it cheap and make it a lot of it fast. And that was important for, for war times. He was a chemist, but he was a countryman first. And uh, his wife didn't really know what he was up to, turns out. But Fritz Haber's also, the, he's also known as the chemical warfare father. He's the father of chemical warfare. He was one of the first ones that 
develop a method to use chlorine gas and there's some battles if you if you google this guy if you if you google this guy he's responsible for some huge amount of deaths in single battles alone like 40 60 thousand people died in, in one battle alone his wife found out about this and it's speculated that she killed herself because she she didn't know what he was up to so it's kind of a bittersweet story there but we can thank him for our modern fertilizers in this process. So, 1909, the Germans had that ability to make fertilizer. We didn't have that technology here yet. Haber teamed up with this Bosch fellow. Haber had a small tabletop model. Bosch is the one who made it industrialized. He, he put it on a big scale. So the two of them together were the ones that came up with this. And, and after world, during World War II, we adopted that technology here in the States. And by then, couple that technology with improved genetics and hybrids, and we look at yields and how they start to go up. Okay, so there was the fertilizer industry starting to come, come into play. Before then, what were we using? We didn't have fertilizer, we mostly used manure. You know, still a great source, but uh, to, to feed the world here, we had to do something else. So if a, if a little fertilizer is good, a lot is what? No good. No good. <laughs> good answer. Wow. It's a pretty sharp gang here. Well, you know, that wasn't exactly what we were thinking all throughout history. Who's heard of the Chesapeake Bay? Yeah. Right? They're kind of like the uh, poster child for what not to do. If you Google Chesapeake Bay and you Google put in your keyword search fertilizer. Whether or not this is reality, I don't even know if this is true, but this is public perception, okay? This sources of nitrogen in Chesapeake Bay. I did not fact check this, but it's, it's striking to me what comes up on the internet. And you know if it comes up on the internet, it's a fact, right? Yeah. <laughs> right? And it, you know, maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but it's what everybody sees. The people in this room make up 3%. There's another 97% watching us. That's scary. Okay, so let's look at some of these sources of nitrogen in the Chesapeake Bay. Right off the bat, what do you see a big part of this pie? Agricultural chemical fertilizer, 15%. Again, I don't even know if these are facts or not. This is perception though. Agricultural manure, 17%. Add those two together, what do you get? Yikes. You're looking at a third coming from us. Let's look at some of the other sources. Atmospheric deposition, agricultural atmospheric deposition. You know, we get that label too. Atmospheric deposition from utilities and industries. Think they have a bullseye on them? I doubt it. Who's got the bullseye here? Are they gonna go after these uh, developed lands, housing plants, or are they gonna come after us? We have a target on us, they're watching. And a lot of strides have been made. Why are we talking about this as an irritation? It's irritating the other 97%, isn't it? It really is. But out of this came some solutions. If we look at what we're doing today versus what we were doing even maybe just 10 years ago, what we do with our fertilizer is a little bit different, isn't it? I, I would think back how many people were spreading 300 pounds of triple 19 just a, you know, a decade ago, and that was their fertilizer program. We just don't do a lot of this anymore. We just don't do it because it's not the right way to do it. It's not an efficient use of our nitrogen. Out of this irritation came solutions, and, and part of that was this 4R nutrient stewardship program actually developed at the Canadian Fertilizer Institute. So this actually came out of Canada, but it made a lot of sense worldwide, so, and a lot of people have adapted this way of thinking. And you've heard Dean Colomer speak. Dean, I think, is on, he's on next, right? And, and every presentation that he puts out has this 4R stewardship program embedded in his presentation. It talks about putting the right source on at the right place, at the right rate, at the right time. It's something we just didn't do a lot of uh, just a few decades ago. At Growmark, 
How do we help do that? We've got state-of-the-art blending facilities. We can come up with custom blends for fields, farms, whatever you want to do. We look at the soil requirements, we look at the crop needs, and we put together a plan. Some of the other irritations that tie directly in to what I was just talking about. As we enter this data age, this big data age, who's got yield monitors out there? I know, I know there's a few in the crowd. Justin's got one. Justin's got one. Even if you don't have a yield monitor, this is probably one of the biggest frustrations I hear with my plot cooperators and, and some of the growers that I work with. They're driving out through the field and they know they're in really, really good corn. And it's really, really good. But they're looking out the window to the left or to the right and just six or 12 rows over. It's crap. And it's like, why is it so different over there and I'm only 50 feet away or 40 feet away? The soil's the same. There's no wet hole over there. It's, it's frustrating. It's very irritating. And if you've got a yield monitor, you know what I'm talking about. You know exactly what I'm talking about. You can see some of these fields that we can map out. Obviously, we know we've got a few deer on the edges here, but you know, yields range from zero to 240 in the same field, and sometimes they're going from real good to real bad right away. And it's really frustrating. <clears throat> and here's where we talk about solutions. Back when I was working at Penn State in the early 2000s, uh, we start. We had some some combines that we were working with with yield monitors on, and we could develop some really fancy looking maps. We even went out and grid sampled in the late '90s, early 2000s. Problem was we we didn't know what to do with all this information. It was like we were walking around with blindfolds on for 30 years, forever for our whole lives, and and you take those blindfolds off and you don't even know where to start. That's kind of how this information overload took over and you know we were working with with professors smart people and and we were digging in so deep we were so deep into the weeds we forgot about what was important and so we had information overload so turning that corner and making decisions out of all that information was a real challenge some people figured it out a company called precision planting who's heard of them Everybody in here, I would hope. They took a lot of this data and made sense of it and used that data and made a better planner. To me, they forced everybody who made planners, they forced their game upward and onward. Another thing that came out of this was the MyField Analytics team. This is a team we've got at Growmark. Justin's going to speak to you later. These guys have been active now for a couple of years. They've taken a lot of this data, and Justin's going to speak about it, and they help us understand these fields on a much smaller basis, and we've now got the tools where we can do a lot of this variable rate spreading, we can do grid sampling, and Justin will speak to that, but it's also helped us do a lot of myth busting. And who remembers last year what we were talking about? Remember what I talked about last year? He jinxed us. We jinxed you. Yeah. Talking about how late we plant, plant how late. corn and still got yields. Hey, well, I still got them this year, too. I just didn't <laughs> share that. We talked about the things we used to think were really, really important, like planting data and population, probably aren't the most important things. Here were the top five factors. Who remembers these from last year? With a lot of data and trying to understand data, out of that came these top five factors. Number one, soil conditions at planting. That will make us or break us. But two, this goes back to precision planting, seed placement, right? It's getting that seed, not just at the right depth and everyone the same, but our singulation. Those guys figured out how important that was. It was a lot of bushels. Seed quality, and you'll speak to that. Obviously the right hybrid in the right field and post-planting management. Four out of five of these don't cost us anything. But these were all, if you would have asked me a couple of years ago, what are the five top things that are most important for producing a crop? I probably wouldn't have had all these on that list. But now, after we've looked at the data and made sense of it, that's where we are. <clears throat> Irritations to solutions. 
again, precision planting. A bunch of genies have started this. I mean, you can say what you want about about uh, the people that, that run it, but I'll tell you what, they're pretty smart. They started with finger meters about, I don't know, 10, 11, 12, 12 years ago or so. A gentleman in our seed group, we, we meet a couple times a year, he came from western New York. He came to our meeting and he, he brought this precision planting pamphlet to our meeting. And it's just the territory seed managers, and he said, "Guys, I think this is something we need to we need to look into, and I think it's going to make our seed look great." And we all looked at him cross-eyed, and said, "Yeah, we need more to do." You know, it turns out he was he was right. The things that they have done to corn planters has has revolutionized the way we farm. They were the first ones to really try to understand downforce management and how to and how to handle that. 2020 monitors, who's got one of those? I, I know there are a few in this gang. They were some of the first ones, maybe not the first, but the first ones to do it efficiently to connect the corn planter to the yield monitor so they can talk back and forth. It's very user friendly. Now they're talking about variable rate seeding, very, multiple hybrids with variable rates. There's no end in sight with this. If you haven't got hooked up with Mike Gardner, I don't think Mike is here today, He's our precision planting guy, and there's nobody better than he is. A lot of people don't start with the Cadillac. They do it incrementally. That that's, seems to be the way to enter this. But anyhow, precision planting. And again, about the MyField team. Back in the early 2000s, we, did, we had so much information, we didn't know what to do. Justin and his team has made this a much more simple approach. It's it's adapted that anybody can do it, whether or not you have the yield monitor, whether or not you've adopted any precision ag on your farm. It's a worthwhile conversation to have with Bruce and with Justin on how to get started into this. He can do grid sampling. He can draw up prescriptions for any field, really. Uh, they can, you know, we've got the ability to do variable rate spreading as well. Right field prescription scouting. The Maverick software, this is something uh, that, that really caught my eye. My boss, he challenged us this year to bring in the MyField team into every research plot that we do. I said, Marty, how the heck are we going to do that? You know, I, I always feel like he's always right. I can't stand it. He's in the room and it drives me nuts. No offense. Most of the time he's right. Not 100%, but most of the time. It, it reminds me of my dad a little bit, you know, but the I told you so. Who's got a dad like that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anyways, he, he challenged he challenged us to bring in this software into our into our program, and we've got an app now where I can look at my phone, draw draw a quick border around any field, and every ten days or twelve days, a satellite can pass over, and it will tell me the good spots and the bad spots in that field, and walked out into a lot of fields with growers into their farms and and you know we're a blue dot walking around you can see yourself walking and as soon as you cross that into that dark green into a red spot there goes your corn you know it's, it doesn't look as good yet the soil types the same everything's the same we've got fertility issues out there that we're not addressing with the way we've been doing it so the bottom line is justin's team can help solve some of those problems and he'll explain why moving on which one are we? I'm that guy some days, I'm this guy some days, but most of you in this room when you're talking about your operation are on this edge right here. And we have to be. And the reason we have to be is right here. Anyone ever heard of Verizon? How about Google? How about Amazon? Who thinks of them as ag companies? Uh-uh. Not so much, right? Well, guess what? We did an exercise a couple years ago in our company, about 200 of us. We broke out into groups and they said, we wanna know what you think your customers will look like in 10 years from now, in 20 years from now. And almost to a group, it's as scary as this is, it, it comes down to the vision that they see is probably corporate farming. It's scary. And that's not where we wanna go, is it? 
it's us calling on, on uh, instead of calling on Farmer Joe, it's calling on farm manager Randy, who works for Google, who manages 40,000 acres. These people are really digging in. The Googles, the Verizons, the IBMs, Amazons, they are digging in and plucking people out of our industry to try to make sense of this so-called big data. And if we're not on our game, if we're not on our game, that that's, can happen. That could happen. And they will, they're buying land. I've heard that they're buying land and they're plucking people. So are they waiting for, this is Sean's view. I mean, I feel like they're just waiting for an opportunity. And it's scary, and I don't like to think of it, but that could be happening. Who's heard of Kodak? Who's had a Kodak camera? Who's had 10 of them? You know? How many of you still use that Kodak camera? Not so much, right? Kodak found themselves lugging the deer out on the shoulders, right? They did. They were on top of the world at one point in time. They just didn't move forward. They forgot how to be this. At one time, that's, that's what made Kodak right there. They forgot how to be that. They lost sight of it. And where are they today? Nobody knows. Okay, here, here's an example. This is a strange example. What's changed in a railroad in 200 years? They're like the rare exception. <laughs> I don't know how. If you ordered something from Amazon and they told you it was getting delivered by rail, what would you think? You'd probably go somewhere else, wouldn't you? <laughs> if you look at other countries and what they're doing, it's not this. They have high-speed trains. They have all kinds of different ways to do it. To me, I, I, I'm skeptical how that's going to go forward in the next century. But on the other hand, I look over here and I look at these yield graphs and I look at that curve and I say the people in here, this is where you are. You guys are the innovators. You guys are the ones trying to make the stone wheel into the casino. And I would just challenge you and encourage you to don't, don't forget that we are that and we have to be that. Otherwise, there's somebody looking to be that. So that's my message to you. Irritations will come and go. We've had them in the past, we have them now, and we are going to have them in the future. The yield graphs prove that you guys are innovators. I'll ask you these three questions. Where do you want to take your yields? What's your plan to get there? And how can we help you get there? That's my message. I'm the setup guy for Andy. I think he's got a few solutions with Justin. And uh, I will leave that. And, and again, it's always a pleasure to come here. I thank you for your time. I thank you for your business. We appreciate it. And uh, don't be that stubborn caveman. I don't think we are anyhow. So thank you, guys. Thank you. Nice job as always.